thank everyone for joining us again for our support after stroke, our free virtual discussion. This week we have Jeff Porter and Catherine McConnell here to have a discussion with us about the physical side of recovery after stroke and how important that is going forward. I'm going to try to get back in my slide. Here we go. So our week that we have these meetings are based on our goal to help reinforce discharge information while exposing stroke survivors and their caregivers to current information on how to navigate life after stroke for virtual, virtual monthly talks. We will be reposting this information again for everyone to see on our Facebook page and again on our website. So you can refer back to the material and any of the information that's available today um, from Jeff uh, is going to be available on our website and our Facebook page. And if you email me and you can't find it, we'll ensure that you get it as well. So I'm going to let you take this, Jeff, the physical side of recovery after stroke. You got it. So we are presenting live from my little tiny office uh, due to technical issues. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. How am I looking, Samantha? It looks great. All right. So let's go ahead and let's begin. So as Ms. Samantha said earlier, we're going to be going over the physical side of the recovery after a stroke. The expectations today is we're going to be trying to take you through the journey of maybe before you go to outpatient, what to see or what you may see during your outpatient therapy and you know what to do before you discharge, some things that you should have ready to go before you discharge. So even if you're in the middle of outpatient or you haven't started outpatient or you've discharged from outpatient and you need somewhere that you need to go and you want information, hopefully this touches every single aspect of that continuum. So Ms. Catherine's gonna go over what to expect on your first evaluation. I'll be talking about a few different interventions uh, that you might see in therapy and try to hopefully make them make sense. Catherine will be taking over again about what you should have prepared for yourself before discharge. Um, and then after discharge, what should you do? What should you expect? We've also included, um, we've recruited, recruit, um, included a resource packet that's going to have a lot of links and a lot of phone numbers to some of the stuff that we're talking about today, along with a tracking guide. And uh, Catherine will be going over that during the lecture. So that way you'll be able to have these resources available to you, to you at any time. And with that said, I'm going to actually hand this off to Miss Catherine. All right. So like Jeff said, we're trying to kind of capture everybody that's listening today. Um, so I'm going to start off from the very beginning of your outpatient experience, kind of going over what to um, expect on the first day. So you usually start off with a one on one session for about an hour with the physical therapist, and they're going to be watching you as you walk in the door, starting to kind of pick apart what things are hard for you to do, what actions are difficult, do we need to work on your balance, your walking, um, what muscles are weak? And so that's what they're looking for are your deficits. And so as they're going through the evaluation and they're doing some tests and measures, they're gonna probably kind of summarize to you what they're finding. Um, but if at any point you don't understand what they're finding or you wanna know more about, you know, what are my weaknesses, it's important to ask. We love explaining things to patients, just sometimes we get caught up in our own medical jargon because um, that's the way that we document. So if there's anything that you find confusing, uh, we want to clarify that for you. So once we go through and we look at which muscles we need to work on, which actions, we're going to set up some goals. And so in a little bit, I'm going to go over with you um, how to write a good goal because it's a common misconception that the therapist is the key person writing the goals but really these goals are about you. So therapy is about you and what you wanna work on, what's gonna make your life better. So we want you to be an active participant in writing those goals. And it's one of the tools that we want you to learn during outpatient therapy. So 
so that you can continue to set them for yourself and show your progress over time, both at home and after therapy's over. Um, we're also going to go over what types of interventions we plan to use based on those goals. So Jeff's going to go over in a little bit some of the equipment that you might see or some of the treatment options you might see that are more specific to someone following a stroke, uh, because rehabbing the brain and the nerves is a little bit different than going through physical therapy for, a, say, a knee replacement or an ankle sprain. So there's some certain treatment options that uh, we often include following stroke to optimize that connection between the brain and your muscles. So after we decide, you know, what are we going to work on? What are the interventions we're going to use? It's also important to know how your progress is going to be measured over time. So we did set those goals together, um, but we're going to use some outcome measures. And so basically the therapist is going to come up with a couple of different tests to track your progress. Um, in a quantitative matter or using numbers. Um, there's a couple of reasons why this is important. Number one, you want to make sure that you are tracking your own success. It's always satisfying to see that you did something a little faster, you lifted a couple more pounds today, you did a couple more repetitions. So that self-satisfaction and that showing of you improving over time is the number one reason for tracking those things. The number two reason, unfortunately, we have this little thing called insurance. It's a necessary evil, um, but we use those outcome measures and those tracking measures to show the insurance company that you're making progress over time. So, for example, um, one of the common insurance companies, Medicare, they only give you 10 visits right out of the gate following your initial evaluation and outpatient. And in those 10 visits, you have to show significant progress or else we can't justify getting more um, visits in outpatient therapy. So it's important that you know what you're being measured on. It's kind of like knowing what the test is going to be before you take the test, um, because that's going to be what proves that you need more visits. And we want to make sure you get as many visits as you need to make optimal improvement. Um, you also want to begin with the end in mind going into your initial evaluation. So this kind of seems counterintuitive, like we're just starting therapy. Why should we be thinking about the end already? Well, I just went through a neurologic residency. Um, so I specialize in working with people post stroke, spinal cord injury, brain injury. And one of the things that they stress to us is because stroke is a very um, significant impactor on your life, it's something that takes a while to recover from. Most of the time, it's not going to be weeks, you know, back to get, getting back to where you were before. It's going to be months maybe a year, maybe we're still going to have some residual problems later on in the future. So therapy, unfortunately, isn't forever. Um, we're typically going to see you for a couple of months in outpatient therapy following a stroke, um, but it's not forever. So we need to come up with an after plan. What are you going to be doing after your graduation day from outpatient? And how are you going to continue to make improvements and exercise on your own and take your health into your own hands. And then finally, um, kind of going along with that, what can I do at home right now? Um, so on that first day near the end of your session or maybe near the beginning of your follow-up session, the therapist should be giving you some exercises um, on things you can work on at home right now at your current level of function. Um, it might only be like two or three. They might seem kind of silly or simple, but they're focusing on things that you need to work on. Um, and it's important that you continue to do those at home and always ask, is there anything else I should be working on? Um, because we're going to continue to update those exercises over time and make them the right challenge level for you. All right, so we're going to take a little step back here to when I was talking about goals. Um, and we're going to go over a formula that physical therapists use to write some really solid goals for their patients. And I want you guys to learn it because, like I said, it's really important to be able to write your own goals so you can continue to work on things at home. So it's the ABCD model of goal writing. Um, it makes it really simple and breaks it down. Each letter stands for a different part of the sentence that makes up your goal. So A is going to be for audience. And so that's the person that the goal is being written for. So a lot of times that's going to be you um, because you're the one that the goal is for. You're the one we're trying to improve, um, but not always. So following a stroke, sometimes you still need some help with a couple of things. 
And so a goal can also be for a family member or caregiver. So let's say right now it takes your brother and your wife to help you get out of the bed in the morning. It takes two people. So a good goal would be let's get that down to one person. So that would be an example of when the audience would be a family member or caregiver. The second letter is B for behavior. So that's what action you're actually trying to improve upon. So I gave a couple examples here, walking, standing up from, transferring, all of those things, anything that you wanna improve upon. C is the condition, and that's the how or the description of how you're gonna do that behavior. Um, so one example would be with a walker, how much assistance am I gonna use? Um, am I gonna walk over solid, or solid ground or am I gonna walk over grass? Uh, am I gonna hold on with one hand? So that's describing kind of how you're gonna do that action. And then D is for degree. And I would argue that that's probably the most important part of the goal writing um, because it's what you're gonna measure. And so an example that I was using is, let's say that my goal is to eat less cookies tomorrow because I eat way too many cookies and it's not healthy for you. Um, if I don't know how many cookies I ate today, I can't tell you whether I ate more or less tomorrow. I've got to count, I've got to have some measurement of what I did initially to show that I improved. So for how that plays into your action is time, speed, distance, number of repetitions. You got to have some way to track numerically um, your progress over time to distinctively say, did I make my goal or did I not? So Jeff was kind enough to make up this little worksheet. Um, it has a location for you to make uh, three different goals for yourself, and you can write the week up in the corner. So thinking about maybe three goals to work on per week, you can bring this in with you to your physical therapist and outpatient if you want them to help you. Um, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to go through it with you and kind of set some of these goals on a weekly basis. But the first section uh, is something that you know you can do without help. So something that you can do, but maybe you want to perfect it or make it a little more efficient. Um, so the example would be standing up from a chair, the kitchen chair, that's how high it is, that's the condition. Um, I'm gonna complete it 10 times in a row, that's my degree, um, the measurement. And then I have it scheduled for each morning I eat breakfast, or after I eat breakfast. So that's a time that I've kind of carved out of my day to make sure that I hold myself responsible for this goal. Then it has a section to rate how hard it was for you. And then the next little line there, is next time I will, and that's gonna be uh, how you determine how you're gonna challenge yourself more next time. How are you gonna kind of increase the intensity or the difficulty next time? The second section is for something that's a little bit challenging for you, but you can do it. So taking it a step up, challenging yourself. Um, and then the third task is something that you need some help with. So this one plays into the idea of uh, having those family members or a safe setup at home so that you can challenge yourself. Um, so you may need some help from a caregiver or a loved one for this one, but something pretty challenging, so much so that you need some help um, so that you have something kind of more difficult that you're working on. So this is a really good tool. Um, it's gonna be in the resources that we are providing in the link um, on the website for this presentation. So you can print it out and use it as you like. All right, so we went over the first day of therapy, kind of that first week, setting some goals. I kind of want to touch base on what to expect for the middle or the remainder part of outpatient therapy. Um, so we talked about your deficits, how the therapist was going to come up with your weaknesses. And um, we have these neuroplasticity principles is what we call them. And it's basically 10 principles or guidelines we go by in order to optimize the relearning of your brain and your nerves. And so we're gonna mention those a couple of times throughout this presentation. Um, so the first one that I wanna talk about is specificity. So the deficits that your therapist finds, they're gonna pick exercises that really hone in on those specific issues or the things that you need to work on. So if something seems silly or you don't understand why you're doing it, there's probably a good reason behind it. Feel free to ask why um, and we'll explain it to you, but they're gonna be really targeting those specific weaknesses. Um, therapy is going to be challenging. That's the second thing that I wanted to mention. Um, it's not gonna be a walk in the park, not gonna be a piece of cake. 
it's going to be challenging and there's going to be things that are hard. You might be a little sore later on in the day, tired. Um, I think the more you go in with that mindset, knowing that it's going to be a pretty good challenge, the more you're going to get out of it because you're going to be mentally prepared to kind of test your limits a little bit. Um, I already mentioned, you know, if anything is confusing or you don't understand, ask why. We love explaining things. We just sometimes get caught up in the excitement of giving you exercises and forget to tell you why you're doing something silly. Um, the biggest goal of outpatient therapy is really to gain the tools for your future. So it's don't think of it as the end of the road, but really a graduation. Um, when you finish outpatient therapy, we want you to be ready to take your health and your fitness into your own hands. So throughout the process, you want to be learning and paying attention to what the therapist is doing um, so that you feel prepared to do that on your own eventually. Um, and then you want to frequently discuss your progress. So occasionally, as a therapist, we'll go down a certain avenue and the, the patient will say, you know, this really, you know, is, isn't working for me, or maybe we're working on something that's not that meaningful to the patient. Um, so we like that feedback and we like discussing with the patients how their progress is going over time so that everyone's on the same page and we're all working on the same goals. All right, so that's during therapy. While you're in your outpatient experience, there's also some things that you want to be doing at home as well. Um, number one being completing your home exercise program. I, of anyone, know that when I get home at the end of the day, the last thing I want to do is exercise, but it's really, really important. Um, and the reason being is because you're only in therapy for two to three hours a week. And I'll go back to my cookie example. If I was on a diet and my diet was to not eat cookies, but I only followed it three hours a week, I wouldn't really be making any progress, would I? I probably would even be getting worse. <laughs> so um, it's the same thing with exercises and therapy. You can go work really hard three hours a week, but if you don't bring that home with you, if you don't integrate what you're doing into your home life and follow the exercises that your therapist gives you, um, it's not gonna make the amount of progress that you're looking for. You've really gotta take that on and do your homework. Um, you wanna make sure that you're setting up your home environment to be safe but also so that you can challenge yourself. Um, so getting friends and family involved, maybe they wanna come into therapy and see how to help you. The therapist can help them guard, they can help them set up your exercises so that they know what to do. Um, and you know, the fear of falling, the fear of being off balance is a real thing, especially when part of your body isn't doing what it originally did or what you want it to do. So trying to set up, you know, something to hold on to to do your exercises, uh, some environment where you feel safe, but you can also challenge yourself is really important to keep up with that home exercise program and to continue to see improvement. So thinking about what you have at home that you may be able to use for those exercise programs. Um, do you have dumbbells? Do you have ankle weights? If not, there's a lot of things that you can use instead. Um, things around the house and your therapist can help problem solve with you different items or different ways that you can do exercise if you don't have the equipment. But really thinking ahead and you know, how am I gonna continue this exercise program later on? And then kind of tying into all of that, the last bullet point there is overcoming your fear. So there's things that are gonna be hard. Um, there's things that might make you a little wary, like maybe the therapist wants you to do some balance exercises at home and you're not really sure about it because it's hard. Uh, same thing, just setting up that safe environment. Find a way that you can do it without feeling that you're going to, you know, be endangering yourself or challenging yourself too much. You want to make sure you set up that safe environment with a family member or support. All right, we're going to go back to Jeff here for a second. He's going to talk about some interventions. Let me see if I can get this off. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so you may see some weird things in your therapy session, and hopefully this shines some light on those things. Now, we say that this is seen in outpatient therapy or your therapy sessions, but the really cool thing is the things I'm going to be going over with the acceptance of maybe two, you can use at home in your own way. So even if you're not in therapy, this and another one near the end is still a beneficial treatment for you. 
So CIMT is constraint induced movement therapy. So take a moment and look at the gentleman that's wearing the blue slash turquoise t-shirt sweater. Um, I'm not very good with colors, but you'll notice something a little off about him. He's using his left hand and his right hand looks like it's in uh, an oven mitt or some sort of mitt. And that is what constraint induced movement therapy is. It is essentially taking away the arm that is the strongest arm. So I'm gonna go over some of the statistics and then I'll come back to why it's important. So the really good thing about this is that it's shown to be an effective uh, treatment option, not only for the patients that have just recently suffered a stroke, but also those who've had it for a very long time up till two or up to 10 to 20 years. Um, there was a gentleman that actually kind of started this whole thing. He's shown, he, he's shown some light on himself. His name is Dr. Taub, um, T-A-U-B. And he did some cruel, unfortunately it was, it was seen as a cruel experiment to monkeys, but we were able to take a lot out of it. And so what he did was he severed the sensory nerves going to a monkey's arm. Let's just say, for example, it's the monkey's left arm. What he did was he severed just the nerves that are giving the information to the brain. So that sensory information, that information that says, oh, you know, my arm is, um, I'm, I'm itching and I, and I want to scratch that. All that information that comes into the brain, it, it, he severed it. And he noticed that the monkeys that had their left arm, that sensory information severed, even though they had full ability to move their arm, they didn't move it because they couldn't feel it. And that's one of the interesting things that led to his next experiment. But I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll elaborate on what happened to the, to the one-sided um, monkey. So after that sensory, was, after that sensory tract was severed, um, he found that the monkeys decided to use their stronger arm or whatever arm was left over. So even if they were right dominant or and they had that sensory cut, they would use, you know, they would use their left arm because it was their only choice. So by, by cutting those sensory nerves and the inability to feel that side of the body, they chose the only option they had left, which was their arm, the, the arm that was remaining, the arm that was unaffected. And so what would happen is those monkeys would then continue to use that arm and use that arm and use that arm. And we have all kinds of different terms for this, um, compensation, learn non-use. We have all different times, uh, types of ways we can clarify this in therapy, but Essentially, what you're doing is you're learning to use your arm, the good arm, all the time for everything, and you're learning to not use your affected arm at all. So that's that learned non-use. So you're kind of getting into this vortex, this dominated pattern where, hey, I'm going to choose to use everything with my good arm. I'm going to do everything, all my tasks, all my chores. I'm going to do those with my good arm, the one I can move, and I'm just going to go ahead and ignore using this arm because it's hard. It's a challenge, and I don't want to do that. So that's kind of, if you, if you think about it, if one side of your arm, if one side of your body is affected, we're going to tend to always go towards the easier side, the, the side that does not take a lot of effort. And that's going to be the unaffected side. So then a follow-up to this actual experiment was um, Dr. Tao went in and unfortunately he severed um, both arms. Um, and by both arms, I mean just the sensory. So the monkey had full, full extremities. He had his left arm. He had his right arm. Um, but the only thing that was taken away was their ability to feel sensation. So imagine not being able to feel either one of your arms. Kind of interesting, but what happened was um, sort of amazing. So because there was no motor problems, and motor means muscle, meaning that you know they could use their arms very easily if they wanted to, they just couldn't feel anything. But because there was no motor deficits, only sensory deficits, he found that when he severed both of their arms, they actually, used both of them, which that's the weird thing, right? Why would they use both of them? They can't feel them. Well, you eliminated their choice. Their one choice before was, I'm just going to use the arm that I feel everything with. I have a complete normal motor control over. That's the arm I'm going to use. That's the arm I feel. But when you eliminate choice, they use both arms normally, which is very interesting. So constraint induced movement therapy came about because of that experiment. They started to use it with patients that suffered um, from a stroke. And what they would do is they would put their good or um, unaffected arm into some sort of restraint. This gentleman's in a mitt. 
or they can be in a sling or they can be in some sort of thing that's going to inhibit them or stop them from using their, their, their arm. And it's going to force them to use their affected arm. Yes, it is going to be challenging. It is not going to be easy to do this. It is, it's, it's supposed to be a struggle. So, but what we found though is those patients, they did this day in, day out, and I believe he did studies for three to six hours. So that's a little bit, that's a little bit crazy, right? A little bit too long, but you could still benefit from shorter bouts. But anyway, these, these patients, they were put in these um, therapy sessions, three to six hours, and they were told to use just their unaffected arm, un or just their affected arm, just their affected arm over and over again. And they started to be regain use of their arm again. They started to regain more function of their arm. Was it completely normalized? Not necessarily, but they were able to do a lot more things in a very short amount of time after this treatment. And this is, um, this is with patients that, have, that are two years post-stroke, 10 years post-stroke, up to 20. So there's always, there's, they showed some sort of gain there. Unfortunately, because it is a um, type of <clears throat> therapy that requires, um, it, it does require some movement. It requires the ability for you to understand what is going on, why you're doing it, because if you don't understand exactly why you're performing this therapy, it may seem like you're, um, you know, that, you, that you're being tied up or that you're being restrained, and that's not the intention. So that's one of them. But the other one is you should have some sort of function or some sort of movement of that wrist and hand. If you had no ability to move your fingers yet, then this may not be the best use uh, of your therapy time at this time. But if you can move your hands even a tiny, tiny bit, this is a great intervention for you because it really focuses on two of the principles of neuroplasticity, which is gonna be A, repetition, because you're gonna be doing things over and over and over again, and B, intensity. And intensity means that it's going to be tough. It is going to be a struggle, but you will remember this just like you remember your, your most struggling moments, your body also remembers those moments as well. So struggle, intensity, that is good stuff. That is, that is your body growing. And if everything's really comfortable, which I'll talk about later, then you need to push yourself to that area of uncomfort if you really want to be successful. So e-stimulation is another um, type of therapy that you may see there. Um, so e-stimulation, what it is, is the therapist may put some sort of pads on your skin. And, and these pads, what they do is they basically communicate with the nerves that fire the muscle. So you, every single muscle has nerves that connect to it. And these pads, you place them on top of that muscle. And what the pads do is they actually can talk to that nerve. Now, the pads all by themselves obviously cannot, but they're going to be attached to this little stimulator. And the stimulator has the ability to modify electricity into sort of wavelengths. Um, and so that's the important thing about e-stimulation is that it communicates to your muscles via, I, I would say it's actually electrical frequency, but let's just say that they're like wavelengths. And so for the pads to actually, for the, for the muscle to actually be able to contract and to be able to, um, to, to move and work, the e-stimulation has to be able to communicate to the, the radio frequency of that muscle. So one thing that I always tell patients when we're about to do a simulation is um, it's the, and this is weird, but it's the storm before the calm. It's the opposite of the old saying. So it's the storm before the calm. And what I mean is that whenever they're turning on that e-stimulation, it's going to feel, you're going to feel vibration initially, and then you're going to feel pins and needles, and it may feel painful. This isn't necessarily pain. What it is is that e-stimulation is trying to dial that, that unit, that e-stimulation unit that you're hooked up to is trying to dial into the right radio frequency of your muscle so it can talk to the muscle. So you may feel uncomfortable, uncomfort at first or discomfort at first, but with time that it's going to be able to tune into that muscle and that muscle is going to start working. And then the sensory information, those pins and needles may start to fade, they may not completely fade but they will fade away. So your muscle will start to contract. It'll start to work. Your muscle may not have been working before, but now you've got this device that's working the muscle and, and making it contract and moving your joints around. And so what good would that be for you? And it's actually been proven that it helps with motor relearning. Obviously, you're gonna have to make sure that the duration and the intensity is appropriate, meaning that are you doing enough repetitions of that exercise? Are you making sure that, that's, um, that that stimulation is actually exciting that muscle? Another thing that it provides is sensory feedback. So it's very important, just like we talked about that monkey earlier that had his tract, his sensory nerves, they were cut. 
sensory impact or sensory feedback is extremely important and has a very heavy impact on all of our motor movements. If we can't feel something, we tend not to use it that much or it, take, it, it, it seems like it takes more effort. And a, and a bad way to think of this is think about falling asleep on your arm, right? Your arm's completely numb and you feel like you can't move it, even though there's nothing wrong with the muscle, you just can't move it. And when you really, really try, you can move your arm. So sensory, again, plays a very big role in this. And by giving feedback to that sensory area of the brain, it can help with some of this relearning. So it's important to keep that in mind that it may feel a little odd, it may feel painful at first, it'll eventually dial into that muscle, be able to talk to that muscle, but it's also going to be giving you information to your brain for sensory as well. There are some downsides. Um, there are multiple contraindications for e-stimulation, pacemaker, or um, types of uh, specific types of cancer. So please make sure that you check with your therapist first, but very powerful stuff. It may seem weird, it may be painful initially, but I promise you, if you can get through that storm, the calm will follow. Another thing that you may see is um, body weight support um, gait training. So there's several forms of this. The one that's on the screen here, the young lady is in something called the light gate. Now the good thing about the light gate is, first of all, you're in something called a permissive environment. And permissive just means you're safe. You're in a very safe place. Even if she were to drop and bend her knees and try to fall, it would be impossible for her to fall as long as the harness is put on correctly. So you never have to worry about falling. What else does it do? Well, that machine has the ability to lift 360 plus pounds. And so it can lift you up, making you a lot lighter. So it's kind of like you're walking on the moon. So this means a lot of really, really cool things, right? The therapist can slow down or speed up your walking. The therapist can sit down on beside you and really work with your leg and they can really gait train and grab you where you need to be grabbed and help you with your gait and help you with your motion. It also, again, allows you that, that, that frequency that we talked about, that intensity uh, and that frequency, you know, doing something and making sure it's challenging. That's going to help you with this because this is going to be a challenging thing. You're going to be put into this, this harness system. You're not going to fall, but you're going to sweat. And at least that's what we're going for. We want you to sweat. We want it to be a struggle. We want it to be a challenge. Another thing is frequency. In this machine, you'll be able to walk long, 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 long durations instead of very short durations. So you'll be able to practice over and over again. So this harness alone will be able to allow you to do all these certain things. Now, it may seem a little weird, but think about, think about how important this impact this will have on your life. This, this small machine, being able to increase your cardiovascular endurance, being able to increase your overall strength, being able to increase your speed, the list goes on, but this overall will increase your quality of life. Even though it's challenging, I promise you, if you can get through this, breathe through it, you will get better, it will get, you will get stronger, you will be able to walk further distances. Even though this machine's a little weird, might be a little scary, just trust your therapist and know that you know, we'll take care of you. All right, I'm gonna hand it back over to Catherine and talk about some discharge checklists. All right. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, um, you go through, you know, maybe a couple months of outpatient therapy following your stroke. Um, and then once you get to the end, we really want you to feel prepared to take your exercise program and pushing yourself and challenging yourself into your own hands. Um, so I'm going to go through a checklist to make sure that you have prepared so when you get to that last week of therapy or so, you're not having a panic attack saying, you know, I don't know what to do. Like, I still need my therapist. We want you to feel confident that you have all these bases covered so that you can go out and continue to exercise, continue to progress over time. So the first thing, um, going back to that home exercise program, we want to make sure that on that last week, we are pushing you in that program and that it's the correct level of challenge for you to go off and continue to complete it on your own. Um, so if you feel that your exercise program hasn't been updated in a while, or you want some more additional exercises, maybe there's something you feel like you don't have exercises to work on, but it's still something that you, you know, wanna be working on at home, have that conversation with your therapist during that last week, and they should be able to give you, you know, a printout with pictures and instructions 
Some of the home exercise programs online now even have videos you can follow. Um, so you wanna make sure that you have that packet or those instructions all ready to go so you can run through those a couple times a week at home and continue with your current exercise program. Secondly, um, you wanna make sure that you have the assistance that you need to complete those exercises. So with the idea of challenging you, um, can my sister set aside an hour or so a couple days a week to come and work out with me and just stand by so I can do some of my balance exercises? Um, do I have you know, bars to hold on to or do, can I use my kitchen counter? Um, if you don't have dumbbells, you can use soup cans, you can use uh, milk jugs filled up to certain amounts with the water to make it you know, heavier or lighter. Jeff, uh, he lifts heavier weights, so he recommended maybe like a sandbag instead of going out and buying really expensive dumbbells that are heavier. You know, maybe you can fill up a sandbag a certain amount and use that as a weight. There's tons of different um, creative ideas you can use. And as therapists going through our experience working, you know, in the field, we have a lot of those ideas under our belt. So if you have a dilemma and you want to know how to perform an exercise at home, we can probably problem solve with you to come up with an idea for that. Um, on your last week of therapy, uh, the last day they're gonna do a reevaluation and go over all of those measures that you did in the very beginning, show you how much progress you've made and see how you're doing on your goals. And so going off on your own after that last week, we wanna make sure that you have some new goals going forward or some ones that still need to be work, you know, worked on. Um, and that you understand what those goals are. So that sheet, again, would be a great resource to kind of set yourself up for success um, or even just verbally discussing with your therapist, you know, what should be my main goals going forward. Um, it's always good to have a way to measure your success over time. Um, asking about community resources is a great idea. I know through Brooks, we have quite a few um, and you know, there's some that are specific to individuals post-stroke and they're out there for you to use. A lot of them are either very reasonably priced or free. Um, so support groups, as you know, or group exercise programs. And we're gonna provide a little um, resource guide in our link with this presentation for some of the programs that are offered. And then lastly, um, I always have this discussion with my patients on their last week of outpatient. It, it's seen as a graduation, it's a celebration. Um, it's also a turning point. Um, up to this point, your life has been therapy, 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 doctor's appointments, uh, exercises. And, you know, it's a lot of hard work. And at this point, graduating from outpatient therapy, it's, it's now time to start adding in back those things you enjoy. Um, you can kind of combine exercise and things you enjoy. If you can find those community resources or exercise groups, get out and be active, do something fun where you're moving as well. Um, but also just kind of looking at your, your mental health as well and setting aside time for you to do things that you enjoy that are separate from therapy or separate from doctor's appointments so that you feel like you're starting to get back to your life again, because I'm sure it's been a long road up until that point. So I always like to bring that up just to make sure we have that on board as well. Okay, so hopefully if you have all those um, boxes checked, we don't get to this point, but every once in a while on that last week of therapy, I see that face that SpongeBob's demonstrating up there in the corner, a little look of panic, you know, deer in the headlights. Can I ever come back again? You know, therapy's over, what do I do? Um, so here's the answer to that. Um, Hopefully you're gonna be able to work out on your own for a little while and still see some improvements. But if you have a change in status, you are allowed to come back to therapy. And so what I mean by that is either a positive change or a negative change. An example of a negative change would be if you had a fall, if you for whatever reason had to go back to the hospital or something new medically is going on that's making you weaker or you know, you're not able to do things the way that you were. Um, you can come back and get reevaluated to see if there's new things we need to work on or get you back to where you need to be. Um, an example of a positive change would be that you go off and you do your home exercise program multiple times a week, you're doing great. And now, you know, I used to have to have someone walk with me and now I'm walking on my own. And the exercises I used to do aren't hard enough anymore. 
So that would be an example of a positive change where you can come back to therapy and we do something called like a six month tune up. It's a couple of visits where we can really revamp your program and show you some new exercises. Maybe you've progressed to being able to work on something new that you weren't able to do before. And so you can come back and kind of do that little check in with your um, physical therapist and get your program revamped. A lot of the clinics that we have, especially with Brooks or other ones in the area for outpatient have something called an independent program. And basically, if you like coming to therapy, you know, three times a week and you like working out, but we're coming up to the end there, you can actually sign up. It's usually very reasonably priced, kind of like a cheaper gym membership. You can come in and use the equipment at your own time. Um, in the clinic, the therapists are available for maybe like quick questions, but you're not working with a therapist. Um, you're either working on your own or with a family member helping you out. And that's a great way to kind of transition from therapy into working out on your own. And then of course, if you have something else going on, you know, we, people who are, you know, following stroke, they have knees too. They, they have, you know, ankles too. So if you have knee pain or back pain or something different going on, or you have a different diagnosis, you can of course come and start a different, you know, round of therapy focusing on that diagnosis as well. Um, so you're not kicked out forever. We'd love to see you again, but we're sending you off on your own to take care of your own health and exercise. All right. All right, I'll be taking over until the end. All right, so what to do after your therapy. So I kind of put some thought into this and I was thinking, you know, what can they do? What are you able to do? And I was thinking that commercial, the commercial was shot with salt and pepper and they're singing to this guy on his lawn and he's pushing his lawnmower pretty well. And they keep singing to him, push it real good, P -p push it real good. And he keeps telling them I'm pushing it real good. Anyway, I thought of that commercial and I thought that was hilarious, but also it's, it's very, it's salient and it's important to this, to this presentation, because if you think about it, your chores that you do right now, they can be your therapy if you choose to make them your therapy. You can do things faster, you can do things for longer, you can do things that are a little harder. So let's go ahead and let's let's break it down a little bit. So the first thing I want you to try to do is during the course of a week, I want you to try to write down as many chores as you have. List them all down and if you can, put them in order. You know, what's easy for you? What's something that's a little bit challenging for you? And what's something that you wanna do but you know you can't? Right, And that'll be perfect for that little bitty handout that Catherine was talking about earlier. That first task that you should do should be something that's easy that you just wanna, that you wanna perfect, right? That could be something like standing up. The next task can be walking to and from someplace without a device or with the device you choose. It should be a little bit challenging, but you should also have a list of those, you know, those, those tasks that you wanna do again, but you know you're gonna need some help. So first thing, Make yourself a list. And then out of that list, try to target which ones that you can work on that'll, that you can get done faster. What is some of them you can get done with, you can take a little bit longer time to do so you can increase the duration, you can increase the work. Um, so you think about different ways that you can change the, change the task around. Can you carry a little bit more? Can you carry a heavier basket? Can you, do the, can you fold the clothes standing up instead of sitting down? Just little bitty things like that that can increase the difficulty because again struggle is what we want we want struggle it is important to have that without that our body doesn't remember now one other thing that's really interesting is if you think about c which is do them out of order what what why why is this important because our brain tends to get into a thought pattern oftentimes when we get up in the morning and we do our routine as we call it um, we don't even remember half the stuff that we did because our brain has it pre-programmed in a way that just makes it very easy to go from one task to another, to another, to another. So one thing you can do is mix it up. Try to change your tasks around. Try to do them out of order. Is it going to be more work? Yeah, of course it is. That's the purpose. You, you want to mix it up a little bit, right? You want to make sure that you can challenge yourself and that you can overcome various different barriers. So more difficult chores are always going to be scary. And Catherine talked about it earlier and she talked about fear and fear to me, um, 
Fear to me is what prevents me from doing something that I want to do that I know I can. So a lot of times when we have somebody that goes home that had maybe, let's say they're walking through their front door, they just got discharged from the hospital. And they walk in and their house looks the exact same. Um, their cats and their dogs, they're all taken care of and their, their, their plants and everything is as normal as it appears. But then they go to open up the garage door and they see that little bitty, that little bitty step that they tripped over, that little bitty lift that they tripped over, which caused them to go to the hospital in the first place. They're not gonna look at that lift the same. They're gonna look at it in fear. And what that fear is going to do is it's going to prevent them from wanting to get near it or wanting to step over it or wanting to, to actually address it. And so fear has a funny way in which it tends to restrict us from doing what we want to do. So that one little lip, that one little thing that's stopping us from going out into the garage, it's going to push us a little further. We may step, we may step back a little bit further and say, you know what? I don't think I can actually get out of the house at this point. I'm afraid to step down from that little step because I fell previously. What's to stop me from falling this time? And so what we tend to do is get in this perpetual cycle that we can't do something because of fear. And fear is going to prevent us from doing that. That prevention is going to cause us to become maybe more a little weaker. And it may be, it causes us overall to be more deconditioned. And because of that, we can't do other things. And, because, and, and the cycle goes on and on. So it's a cycle of fear stopping us from doing activities. The lack of doing activities stops us from, you know, having a good, having good cardiovascular conditioning. It stops us from doing the things that we need to do. And so we grow more fearful of easier tasks. So the biggest thing to do is confront those fears. And that's why we always say, make those tasks that you want to do you got to try to do them once a week, but make sure that you have family members, make sure that you somebody's there to watch you, to take care of you. So that way, if you do, if you do happen to mess up or you start, or you struggle a little too much, they're right there. They've got you, but to not face these fears is going to allow them to conquer you. So just be conscientious of that when you're going home or when you're, when you're at home and you want to do something, make sure somebody's there, but you've got to try to do it. So we did, we did include a um, resource, a tracking sheet in the resources, and we've got, I believe we have it linked on the Facebook. We have it linked in this invite. So there's lots of different ways that you can get access to it. Um, we encourage you to try to fill out, those, fill out those tasks and try to push yourself. So this is just a little bit of um, information that we found during our research when we were creating this PowerPoint. Um, I thought it was just really interesting, so I wanted to put it in here. So a bunch of different studies talked about how Cardiovascular or aerobic, um, aerobic conditioning is beneficial for learning something, for learning things that you like, for example, um, being able to play something like on the piano or being able to, um, you know, use, use your utensils or use your, um, use your hand in a different way that you weren't able to do it before. What this means is that if you look at the resource or research, it says that if you do 45 minutes of moderate exercise three times a week. So that can be a Monday, a Wednesday, or Friday. Um, if you were to follow up right after you did that exercise within maybe five, 10 minutes, that activity that you were trying to do, that motor learning and processing of that activity become a little bit easier, a little bit more efficient. So for example, if I were to say, go and walk the stairs for 45 minutes straight, and then I wanted to come back to the piano and learn a song, during that window, right after I finish my cardiovascular exercise, right when I sit down at that piano, that task that I'm doing, I'm going to be able to learn it a little faster. I'm going to be able to react a little quicker. I'm going to have more precision. And there's a lot of theories out there as to why this happens. The biggest theory is that after a bout of exercise, your body releases a whole bunch of really cool little hormones inside of your brain, well, neurotransmitters inside of your brain. And they're called um, brain-derived neurotropic factors. Um, and so what it is, is these are types of growth factors that are released after exercise. And so the theory says that with all these different growth factors being released in your brain, they're activating all these different neurons and basically making them more hyper aware of what you're doing. So if you exercise before a task that you wanna do, 
it shows that you may have a little, you may have a simpler time, you know, completing that task or learning that task. Um, one study says, you know, doing it three times a week shows overall improvement with everything that you attempt at um, that, you know, that requires an volitional focus or intensity, um, grasping using your hands, trying to, um, you know, catch, the, catch and drop a ball, bounce a ball, um, different things that you can do with your hands. Another study says that only, it only really requires one bout of moderate exercise to do this. So that one bout is still going to release that, those, neuro, those little brain chemicals and allow you to learn that task, even if it's just one time. The important thing though to remember about this, and this isn't included in this little piece, is that when you stop doing that, um, those aerobic exercises, the cardiovascular exercise, unfortunately the, the, the neurotransmitters, all that fun stuff, it stops being released as well. So it's one of those things where you have to keep it up. If you wanna to continue to progress, you have to keep it up. You can't just expect you know, that you're gonna have this superpower anytime. You wanna be consistent with this. You wanna make sure that you're doing these exercises and then practicing what you need to practice after those exercises. So overall, what does this mean? It may be beneficial to do some cardio if you wanna get the most out of your therapy. Okay. so. What Catherine and I did was she was, while she was doing her, she's studying during her, um, for her, her board examination, she kind of looked through a whole bunch of different articles. And we were able to take all of these different articles and sort of summarize them. Now, what we found was we broke it into four different categories, balance, flexibility, strength, and aerobic condition. And these different articles, they said different things. So we kind of averaged out what it was they were saying. Because some said 45 minutes, some said just 30, some said um, five to eight repetitions, some said you know 10 to 12. So we averaged it out. These are the best guesses that we have, and you're gonna have to work with a therapist in order to make sure that you can fine tune this for you. But when it comes to aerobic compat, so cardiovascular heart, heart health, it, they recommend uh, 30 minutes, three to five times a week doing that. Now, there is something that you may hear, you may know of already. It's called the rating of perceived exertion. Um, there's a modified version of it. It's, it's from a one to 10 scale. And it's just like the pain rating scale that you're familiar with. Um, one means that that activity was extremely easy and 10 means that that extra activity was the hardest thing ever. Um, so what they say is whenever you're doing these exercises, they, they should be something called a moderate difficulty, roughly about a four to five on that scale. Another way, to con another way to judge that is when you're walking, you should be able to talk to your friend, but it should be challenging. You shouldn't be able to have an entire conversation while you're walking. If, it's, if you're having a conversation, a full conversation without, the, without having to stop to breathe, walk a little faster as long as you're being safe about it. And the reason why is when you're not able to get a, a full sentence out or you're struggling, it's telling you that your body's working pretty hard. It's not the hardest. I'm sure you've all been in those situations where you, can, you can't even speak because you're breathing so hard. So that's what they consider. That's, that's a good recommendation for cardiovascular condition. Regarding strength training, um, this is gonna be depending on your therapy. You may already have some exercises, but they recommend about eight to 10 different types of exercises that you can do, eight to 10 um, repetitions of that exercise. But the last couple, eight, nine, and 10, should be challenging. So let's say you're, you're doing, for, for example, let's say you're just doing a bicep curl. The first six may not be challenging and, and that's okay. But when you get to seven, it should start to be a little more challenging. When you get to eight, you should start to feel struggle. It should take effort. And that's the purpose. Again, we're gonna come back to that neuroplasticity principle is, is you need effort, you need struggle, you need to have that intensity. So reps eight, nine, and 10 should be challenging to you. If they're not, increase the weight or slow down the reps. You'll notice that when you slow down the reps, it's gonna challenge the muscle a little more. They recommend to do, um, I believe it's two or three sets. I did not include it in the actual literature here, but two to three sets of each of those reps and then program it for two to three times a week. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, you can kind of set it up. Um, it's good to have strengthening and, con strengthening and uh, aerobic conditioning put together because both of those work together in parallel to um, give you the best benefits after, um, after a stroke. They do help to promote all kinds of different things we spoke about before, being able to do tasks, the memory, the retention, all this fun stuff. So working those two together 
is a fantastic thing to do. Flexibility is just stretching. So what they recommend is to hold your stretches for 30 to 60 seconds. You should feel a, a discomfort. You should feel a, a, a pretty strong discomfort um, to do this for three reps. So a total of maybe three minutes. And then lastly, we're gonna have some, we have it in our resource section. We went through YouTube and we, we checked out a bunch of different videos that we thought were safe for you. But there's different types of balance things that you can do like Tai Chi, boxing. And we also do have, Brooks, Brooks Rehab does have adaptive yoga. And we left the resources for all of our adaptive sports as well inside the, the contact number for adaptive sports inside our resource guide. So please make sure you check that out so you can get in contact with them. So there's all kinds of different balances that you can do. We've um, balance exercises, balance routines. You can find them on YouTube. Uh, one thing that we both suggested was that when you do attempt to do something, first of all, watch the video first, make sure it's something that you are able to do. If you feel it's gonna be a struggle, make sure somebody's there. So don't push yourself. Don't don't do something that is well outside of your range. Challenge yourself. Make sure somebody's there. Watch the video first, but keep yourself safe in the end. That's the most important thing. So there's lots of different things that you can do. All of these all of these different modalities uh, have fantastic results in, in research. So please make sure that you check out the resources so that way you can guide yourself and give yourself a good outline of some of your own exercises and, and um, therapeutic approaches that you can do at home. So this is our, our resource. It's a very short list. The other list is much more comprehensive. Um, so just kind of give you a broad overview. There's the stroke wellness that we have. That's going to be located in Ormond, Port Orange, and Deland. We have adaptive sports. Unfortunately, adaptive sports right now is virtual, which is still fantastic. They will walk you through it step by step online um, via Zoom like we are right now. So you still have the virtual option. But it's going to be, um, we're, we're, we're closed until 2021, I believe, and then we'll be opening up to the public again because uh, we want to make sure that we're respecting the, the COVID precautions. Independent program is what um, Ms. Catherine was talking about earlier. Uh, it's sort of just like a gym membership. After you, finish up your, uh, after you finish up your therapy, you can continue to use the equipment there. We currently have it in five different um, Brooks clinics. We have it at Daytona, West Volusia, Palm Coast, Deltona, and Ormond. And I've included the list and all of the numbers in the resource guide. Along inside of that resource guide, you'll find the mobile applications. Now, this is a website that it links you to all the different types of things that you may want to work on. So you've got your, if you wanna work on your memory, if you wanna work on sequencing, if you wanna work on any of the things that you're struggling with, it gives you like a big umbrella view and then you can kind of go down and you can select exactly what you wanna work on. So that's a, a website that's on the resource, please. We're free to check that out. And then lastly, we've got the YouTube videos. Uh, we went through several different ones. There's a really good uh, physical therapy channel I subscribe to. It's called Bob and Brad, but they have an entire section that's dedicated to different stroke interventions. I just linked the entire playlist there. I linked the entire playlist for chair yoga, chair yoga, so that way you can kind of pick what it is that you want to do and what you think that you're capable of. Again, when you're doing YouTube, watch the video first, make sure it's something that you're capable of doing. And then if you feel like it's gonna be a little bit of a challenge, have somebody there to help you. All right, and this is the last, the, the closing statement. And you know, this actually initially was a, a saying that I, I loved, it was by Abraham Lincoln, but I decided to change it up because this one seemed to be more pertinent to the topic. And if you're familiar with this, it's a well pump. And you take that little handle that's on the end this little handle right here. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna bring it up and you're gonna bring it down, you're gonna bring it up and you're gonna bring it down. And you're probably gonna pump it about 10,000 times or so it seems. You're probably gonna have calluses on your hands, your back's gonna give out, you're probably gonna fall on the ground. You may be some, maybe some tears on the way to get the water flowing. The thing is, is it takes a lot of effort before you see anything. And that's why I wanted to bring it into the situation because your life and therapy is just like this pump. It may seem like it's, it's, it's too challenging, it's too much, that you're not getting anything out of it, that you, know, that you can't do it because you're not seeing results. And because I'm not seeing results, I'm going to give up. And that's the same thing with this well pump. You can pump it a hundred times and you're not gonna see results. And that's what's scary about therapy is that if you don't see results immediately, we tend to get discouraged and I wanna challenge you to look at life a little differently, to look at it as if you've gotta have, like you're approaching a well pump, it's going to take effort, 
It is going to take everything out of you to get this thing flowing. Once you get it flowing, it's easy. Once you get this well pump going, once you put the effort in and you start to see the benefits, you start to see that you're getting better, that you're getting stronger, it becomes easy. But you have to step into it. You have to be okay being uncomfortable. I think we've stressed that enough today. I hope we have. But going forward, think about what you want to do. What is it, what is it that you really want to do in, in, in life? What do you want to do in one year from now? Set yourself a goal and write it down. And then think about everything that that goal has within it. Now, I've included a really cool YouTube link that actually talks about something simple like um, progressing walking from being not even able to stand up to progressing to walking. And so I encourage you to, to watch that if you are struggling with your walking, if you want to increase your walking, if you want to get better. There is a step-by-step, -step, and I believe it's about 60 minutes long. So it's going to take some time if you're interested in that. But think about that goal that you want to do. What do you need to be able to do? So, for example, if we're using walking, first of all, you need to be able to sit up because if you're walking and you're leaning way over to the side like this, you're not going to be able to walk for very long. You're likely going to fall towards the ground, probably going to lean this way. It's not going to be, it's not going to be very successful. So the first thing is breaking it down. I have to be able to have good trunk control. I have to be able to sit up. Next step is, am I able to shift my weight forward? Am I able to lean forward? Am I able to offload my butt so I can start to lift my, my butt off the ground and start being able to stand? And then eventually being able to stand up. Am I able to stand for longer than four or five seconds without help? Am I, do I have to rely on something to hold on to? Am I grabbing something for long periods of time to do this? And so take time and write down what it is that you want. Break it down into pieces right? And then start to set goals for those little pieces. Start at the very beginning. Start, little, start, start with little bitty goals and be your, own, be your own clinician, if you will. Now, don't get me wrong, we are going to be the experts here, but that shouldn't stop you from trying to be your own clinician at home. One of our biggest things that we want is advocacy for the patients, empowerment of the patients. And so we want to make sure that you understand that you can drive your goals, Make sure that you understand what it is that you need and slowly create little bitty steps to get there. Don't be discouraged. Don't give up. It's going to take effort and you won't see anything initially. You will not see anything initially, but take time. Keep pumping and keep going and eventually you will start to see your results. So with that, I want to say thank you all for coming and I'm going to open it up to any questions that you may have. Um, on the floor to, for both Catherine and I. So I want to say again, thank you so much. Well, and I appreciate you. Beautiful. <laughs> no, they've done oh. so well. I am muted at some point. Like, she was like, we had some communication. Like, they had issues with so. contractors. Yes. Like, um, but it's on the river, and they had to do a lot of stuff. Um, Well, it seems like we have somebody, they're communicating <laughs> to each other, but not to us. Um, okay. Does anybody have to unmute everyone? Uh, if you have any questions for Jeff, uh, please direct your your call. I'm going to unmute you, just okay. letting you all know. So, so it looks like where the pool ends, it looks like it just like goes out the river. Oh, like, where are The culprit. So the static is working fantastic. We're, we're hearing lots it's of static. Lovely. Can you try typing Does in the chat if you're. Good information. Do you guys see the chat box? Yeah, we can see the chat box here. Okay. I'm going to mute everybody again. Only because. Is Kathy okay, or are you like Catherine? Uh, Catherine. <laughs> I'll, I'll 
music or something. <laughs> I'm not seeing anything. So I think I think we're okay for now. Okay. That was a wonderful uh, discussion. Very, I think it was really good as far as um, motivational because I think uh, if anybody's still on the radio, the phone lines, they can hear us. Still, um, I think the motivation is huge, right? Because if you don't see instantaneous results, we're in a world of instant gratification. So if you don't see instantaneous results, sometimes that can be quite frustrating. So I'm glad that you went over that uh, with everyone so that when they do re replay this, so they do see this. Um, they can understand that it does take time and it does take effort on their part um, to gain that positive mobility that they're looking for again. But if we have Absolutely. no questions, I am going to then um, let you guys get on with the rest of your day. And I'm going to have this uploaded for everyone to view on our Facebook account, along with all those pieces uh, that you had sent sent me the other day. I placed it on Facebook, and I know that Ashley said she was going to be placing it also onto the um, onto our website, so they can easily uh, be able to access them. Okay, and then I took your resources and I reiterated it so that it was in a document view on um, the Facebook page. I don't know if either one of you have Facebook, but please go and take a look and make sure all the pieces are available that you like. And then, uh, and then we can review that as well. So again, thank you guys very much. And I am going to now end our recording.